Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today is December 5th, 2018. It is 9.30 a.m. and this is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Seattle City Council's Planning and Land Use and Zoning Committee. I'm Rob Johnson, Chair of the Committee. I'm soon to be joined by my colleagues, Council Members O'Brien and Herbold. But we've got a lot on the agenda today, so we wanted to start promptly. Um, there are seven items on the agenda today. We're going to start with three reappointments to the Planning Commission. We'll follow with a briefing, public hearing, and possible vote on an amendment to the comprehensive plan. A briefing, public hearing, and possible vote on amendments and changes to our transportation level of service standards that are required inside new developments. And finally, a discussion and votes on uh, the University of Washington's major institution master plan. As a reminder, um, we've got about two dozen or so folks that are here in the audience today and uh, about that many that have signed up to give public comment. That final agenda item related to the master plan is a quasi-judicial matter, which means that it is prohibited to give public comment on that topic. So if you're here to talk about issues that are germane to the council's committee, that's great, but you can't talk about the University of Washington master plan process and I'll have to cut off your testimony if you do. Um, we are going to start this morning with public comment. Um, it's a little complicated this morning because we've got two public hearings, but the general public comment, we've got uh, eight folks who've signed up to give public testimony. You'll each have two minutes. Several of you have also signed up to give public comment during the additional public hearings. We'll get to those when the public hearing for that relevant topic arrives later on in the agenda. The first person who signed up to give comment is Alex Zimmerman, followed by Knut Ringen and then Ed Marquand. Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. Ringen, if you wouldn't mind coming to the microphones and we'll get started. Thank you. Please. Hi, um, I want to speak about agenda number one, about reappointment of three commissioners. Uh, I go to commissioner meeting in uh, uh, Seattle uh, uh, government for last 10 years, probably 100 times. Then I speak always. And nobody give me question, nobody asking what is going on, you know what it means. And I try apply for 10 years like a dozen times myself, and nobody accept me. I'm totally confused. I'm top educator, have six elections, include U.S. Senator. I'm in political for all my life. I cannot be qualifying for one commission for 10 years. So I try to find answer, what does this happen? And I think I find this answer. It's exactly what has happened. We have a government, anti-Semitism, and racism. It's nothing surprised me. So I have nine trespasses. Last trespass expired in this Monday for one month, what has come from council, nine trespasses for 930 days. Nobody in the United States of America have this. It's a show, so we have a government anti-Semitism and racism, what is absolutely equal, what is I see before from Soviet Union communists and from German Nazi. I cannot understand how educate, top educate men have experience with politica. I win two class action, one class action is unique, first in this American history, cannot qualify for one commissioner. I'm totally confused. So right now I speak to everybody who listen to me. Something wrong with this government. Something wrong with this government who acting like a pure Nazi communist, crooks and fascist. I cannot understand how professional men like me cannot be qualified qualification for one committee for 10 years. So right now I speak to everybody. Stand up, America. Zeke Heil, my Dory Thank Council. You, Mr. Zimmerman. Thank um, you very much. Knut Ringen, you're going to be followed by Ed Marquand. And Ed, if you wouldn't mind coming to the next microphone. Knut. Thank you, Councilman Johnson. Uh, this is the third day that we are here. In the, be the last for a while, so uh, appreciate your patience. I have two handouts for you. Um, my name is Knut Ringen. I'm from the Fisher Studio building, a historic landmark on 3rd Avenue. And uh, we have two very serious concerns about a specific development that has been proposed along 2nd Avenue. And our concerns are twofold. The first is about the upzoning of 2nd Avenue that took place 10 years ago and the consequences of that that is happening right now. And the second is about how the de design review process is broken and is not working the way that it should. The wall that's being built as being proposed with 500 foot how tall towers will divide the city in two zones, the, the, the west zone and the east zone. This will take away the light 
it'll take away the light of the so-called Pike Pine light corridor, and um, it will make it very, very difficult to maintain the character of the city. In terms of the design process, if you look at the second side of this sheet I have, um, we have made several objections to this project. Nevertheless, it was passed unanimously by the review board, even though it did not at all follow the design guidelines that they're supposed to follow. Now, if we cannot have our say or be heard in the design process, we're going to have to come back here time and again, or we're going to have to litigate these issues, and we shouldn't have to do that. Specifically, we need you to address four questions or five questions that I've outlined on that sheet and that I don't have time to deal with right now. We're fighting for a system where one party, the developer, does not take all at the expense of everybody else. We want fairness in this system and we need an organized system. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Ed, Ed, you're going to be followed by Julia Bebu. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Please, Ed. Thank you so much and thanks for hearing me. I'm <coughs> here to also represent the Fisher Studio building and I uh, would like to reinforce what Knut has said. Um, nobody in our building is against the building that's going in front of our building. We'd rather not have it, but we're well aware that that property will be developed. But during the design review, the developer asked for everything in the world. And because of, a, because of an error of that hearing with three volunteers, 10 minutes of time given to express all of the complaints with that building, it was passed unanimously. It will affect hundreds and hundreds of people in the surrounding area, and that project is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Surely the neighbors of that building should have more of a voice of what that building, what that neighbor becomes. <clears throat> We're concerned about the traffic, we're concerned about the light, we're concerned about the fact that on our block there are four important historic buildings that have been completely ignored in this design process. The process itself is flawed. Having three architects who are potentially professionally conflicted in the process is not the best way to design for the, these huge, massive buildings in downtown Seattle. I'm all for density. I'm all for growth. I've lived downtown in Seattle for 40 years. I was part of, of becoming, um, I wanted to live in the city. I certainly understand that. But for these buildings to be going up, essentially to be filled with people who are trying to get US visas is not the sort of development Seattle needs. We do not need to become another Vancouver. And that's what I'm here to argue for. Thanks Thank so you. much. Uh, Julia, you're going to be followed by Megan Cruz. Uh, yes, my name is Julia Biabald. Um, I'm also a resident of the Fisher Studio Building. Um, I'm also a lead accredited professional and a registered professional engineer with over 20 years experience in the building design and construction industry, 10 years of which have been devoted uh, specifically to sustainable design. Um, and I also am in favor of development on this site. We all recognize the housing crisis that is occurring in Seattle and are particularly in favor of its use for residential development. Um, but we do have serious concerns about the property as it is currently proposed. It violates uh, core sustainability principles, in particular to be in dialogue and in integration with its past, present, and future environment. Some of these uh, violations are uh, Knut and Ed have already addressed, uh, particularly the historical past. We are, uh, the building has, six, excuse me, the block has six historic properties on it, um, many of which were uh, original foundational buildings to uh, Seattle's downtown, one of which is on the National Historic Register, ours which is a city landmark building. These are buildings that actually predated mixed use before mixed use was a thing 
thing. Our building in particular uh, was a sort of early Carnegie Hall of Seattle and is foundational to the current modern day arts movement in Seattle. So they're not just architecturally important, they are historically and culturally important buildings. The uh, design as currently proposed would dwarf these and place our buildings in permanent shadow um, and je jeopardizing their future. Um, in terms of the present uh, integration, as they've talked about, there's really been no uh, uh, meaningful way for us to engage in our neighborhood, uh, our neighborhood's future. Um, and then in terms of the future integration, there are serious concerns about the traffic and delivery you, that it would, it would pose. Thank you for joining us this morning. Megan, you're going to be followed by Steve Rubstello. Thank you. I'm Megan Cruz, also of the Fisher Studio Building. And I echo my neighbor's concerns, and I would like to talk about the process here. Um, an error was made. The Design Review Board declined to mitigate the effects of height, massing, bulk, and scale, saying it wasn't in their jurisdiction, nor was it in their power to mitigate the 15-foot alley, 16-foot alley that separates the two very different zones. That's not true. These are in the guidelines. What I think would help in this uh, matter, these buildings are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. I think the Design Review Board is very afraid to make a move that could be litigated or they could come back and, and um, be questioned. I think we do need uh, somebody that's not volunteer working in the system, and we do need to have these taped just the way this meeting is taped so that it's on the record. And if an error was made, there would be a, a, an, an impeachable source to go back to that. Um, the second thing is that we uh, support fully the hearing examiner's uh, request that s historic landmarks are protected and that we in the um, era of upzoning. Um, so we hope that you take that seriously and, and work that into the uh, legislation. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Steve? Steve, you're our final speaker this morning on this part of public comment. Well, as Ronald Reagan would say, here we go again. We're going to have to, this is a national day of mourning, and I expect that's a very good day for a land use meeting in Seattle. Uh, I mourn the loss of citizen participation when the whole idea of the larger zones, the urban villages came about and the larger buildings. Design review was a key part of it, and it was just not the color of the building. It was to look at parking look at how it met with the neighborhood. Was it on a border? And we were going to have scale. You see, we saw all these wonderful charts about how when you put a bigger zone near a smaller zone, how the bigger zone, it was going to come down and it was going to be transition. Well, we don't get much transition in the city of Seattle and we don't get a heck of a lot of public participation. And, you know, some would say you kind of welched on the deal. And I think as a member of the public who's been around for a while, I really feel that the city does not care about its citizens presently. You care about your stakeholders. You are loyal to Donald Trump or any other large developer, and you are more than willing to accommodate big time construction. At the same time, Citizens, remember we have an emergency in this city about housing. You don't want to count the housing that is destroyed and you charge so little to developers compared to anywhere else in the country that uh, most people have found. So that what we're going to have, maybe in five, ten years, we'll have some replacement housing. But what happens during that five, ten years and probably the 20 years before that new housing becomes much more affordable. In the meantime, uh, it's not good. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that concludes public comment. Um, for the folks that have been here for the last three days testifying on a particular development downtown, um, I think it's fair to say that each member of this committee has heard you now three days in a row, both at the um, Monday MHA discussions again yesterday at the Sustainability and Transportation Committee and then again here this morning. Um, because of the um, volume of work that has gone on over the last couple of days, my office has not had a chance to follow up with the Department of Construction and Inspections to get a better understanding. But we certainly have your information and once we have a better understanding about the process that this project has gone through, we'll follow up. 
So with that, we'll move on to agenda items one through three. While Noah reads those into the record, I would ask our presenters to come forward. Agenda items one through three, appointments 01196 through 011, uh, excuse me, 01194 through 01196. Reappointment of David A. Goldberg as member Seattle Planning Commission for a term to April 15, 2021. Reappointment of Richard E. Moeller as member Seattle Planning Commission for a term to April 15, 2021. And reappointment of Julio A. Sanchez as member Seattle Planning Commission for a term to April 15, 2021. Thank you. Let's do some brief introductions. Good morning, council members. I'm Vanessa Murdoch, executive director of the Seattle Planning Commission. Good morning, council members. My name is Julio Sanchez, and I represent uh, I, the planning commission here as one of the members to be reappointed. So, Vanessa, we've got three reappointments this morning of folks that have been serving on the commission for some period of time. Why don't you walk us through those reappointments, and then we'll get to a couple of questions for you, Mr. Sanchez. Certainly, thank you. Um, so the two reappointments that I'd like to speak to are uh, first David Goldberg. Uh, David Goldberg has been, was a first appointed to the commission in 2017. He is currently an ombudsman for WashDOT, uh, representing the 520 project. He um, has paid, played a key role in smart growth. Uh, he is a former journalist and he is currently co-chair of our land use and transportation committee. Uh, Rick Moeller was appointed in 2018, earlier this year. Rick is a architect uh, and professor of architecture at the University of Washington. He uh, lives in the Tangletown neighborhood of Seattle, and I should mention that David Goldberg lives in Wallingford, and I'm happy to answer, try to answer questions on their behalf. And uh, Mr. Sanchez, you've been serving for quite a little while now, three years, two years, three years? Three years. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about the work that you've done on the commission so far and what you plan to do with the uh, remainder of the time that you've got with the reappointment? Thank you. Um, I'd like to highlight the teamwork that happens in the commission because when you are part of the planning commission, you're actually part of a group of people that works as a team, works together. And some of the things that I believe need to be highlighted uh, from the uh, teamwork that we do is the stewardship of the comprehension, comprehensive plan, the uh, neighborhood for all report. Here is a copy in case anybody wants to take it, um, the support for the MHA measures, and of course the removal of barriers for the construction of accessible uh, dwelling units, aka backyard, backyard cottages. So that is some of the work that we have done, done as a team. Personally, in my, as I continue to uh, work with the commission, I also like to continue representing the community where I live, the central district, and the community where I have lived for the almost last 10, 15 years. So that's my personal goal. Great. Um, you know, we're, I think, um, very um, happy to have so many great leaders on the commission that have been working on really difficult problems for a long time. You know, you go back to commission reports from 10 or 15 years ago that started highlighting some of the challenges that we're now seeing today around industrial lands pressures. And mm -hmm. about half of our agenda relates to reports that the commissions uh, authored in the 90s and the 2000s. So I'm really grateful to the work that the commission does and grateful to you for your interest in continuing to serve. I'd ask if my colleagues have any questions or thoughts that they might like to add. I'll just uh, second what Councilmember Johnson said, Mr. Sanchez. I thank you for your ongoing commitment to this. I know, um, well, I pretend to know how much time, how time consuming it is to serve on the Planning Commission. I can only imagine how much that is. And I really appreciate your willingness to be part of that. I'm really grateful, frankly, that you came today. It's a reappointment and mm -hmm. folks don't have to come and not to criticize the other two for not being here, but it's great that you showed up here. And I appreciate the other work you do in community and the perspective you bring to this work. And um, you know, the Planning Commission really challenges us um, through conversations and through very thoughtful reports on how to think about where the city's going and that work is invaluable. Um, it's not without controversy and I really appreciate folks, um, you know, the group that sits around those tables and thinks about just picking what we want, what you want to work on next. 
how you're going to approach it, what lens you're going to look through it. And I've, um, I've always been impressed with the thoughtfulness and the um, kind of foresight and frankly, the, the racial justice and social justice lens through which you think of land use and help me and others think of these sometimes kind of wonky um, technical issues that have a real impact on how we live in a city and who gets to live in the city and uh, you know what that looks like. So thanks so much for, for all that you do. And I'm really grateful that you're willing to serve another term. So thanks. Thank you. Ditto all of that. I appreciate your willingness to serve and the approach you bring to this work. Um, I do want to just make note of um, a couple things about the composition right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see that um, as it relates to the geographic composition mm -hmm. of the Planning Commission, um, we don't have any representation from districts two, four, and seven. A um, lot of uh, representation um, in District 6. We've got um, eight folks from there, um, only two from District 3, so thanks for uh, sticking with it, um, and one from District 1 and one from District 5. So I think um, in Districts 5, 1, 2, 4, and 7, there's some, some work to be done. Um, and similarly, I think on the uh, diversity um, work as well. I think there's some some efforts to be made there, and uh, maybe can accomplish both um, in in one effort. Uh, you know, sort of benefit both the diversity side and the geographic side um, with upcoming appointments. So appreciate you taking a look at that. Certainly, and and it is our desire and our effort to have both a geographic diversity, a gender diversity, a perspective diversity, and um, we'd love to work with your office and other offices in the council to um, increase our geographic diversity. We did have uh, two people on, three people from West Seattle who um, weren't not able to fill their terms. So we, uh, we, in the opening positions that we will have next year, we will certainly be reaching out to your office and others to help. I, I would appreciate um, helping you do that outreach. Thank you, I appreciate it. If I could add to uh, personal notes uh, of uh, recognition, I want to recognize that the reason why I was able to join the commission is because I was given the opportunity to go through a uh, leadership program, development leadership program that was and still functioning under Puget Sound Sage. Uh, this is the third year that the leadership program is continuing and being exposed to that um, growth opportunity is what brought me to the uh, opportunity of being in the commission. So I want to please ask that in any way you can support similar leadership programs, please continue to do so. And I also want to recognize the staff that helps the commission because we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do if it wasn't because of the staff. So I just wanted to add those two notes. Thank you. Excellent comments. <laughs> it's okay. an outstanding program that Puget Sound Sage runs and others do similar programs, but thanks for highlighting that. It's a great point. So seeing no further discussion on this, I'd move uh, to confirm appointments uh, 1194 to 1196. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed. Those appointments are confirmed. Mr. Sanchez, thank you again for being here. We will have the appointments in front of the full council on Monday the 10th. You're welcome to join us, but certainly not required to be there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate you being here. Uh, let's move on to agenda item number four. And while Noah reads the short title of that into the record, I'd ask those presenters to please come forward. Agenda item four, Council Bill 119424, an ordinance relating to land use and zoning, amending the Seattle Comprehensive Plan to incorporate changes proposed as part of the 2017-2018 Comprehensive Plan annual amendment process. Welcome Lish Whitson of our own Council Central staff to walk us through this set of amendments related to the comprehensive plan and Vanessa Murdoch from the Planning Commission Great. sticking around to provide feedback. Great. Uh, so this is the final step in the 2017-2018 comp plan amendment process. Um, in April 2017, there was a call for potential amendments to the comp plan. Uh, council members received a number of proposed amendments in August of 2017. You set a docket of amendments to be considered. Um, those were grouped in four different categories. Um, mandatory housing affordability related amendments that you will take up next year along with the other MHA related um, legislation. Impact fee related amendments that are currently on hold pending uh, resolution of environmental 
uh, review appeals, um, industrial area amendments, which are still um, pending, and then uh, another set of amendments that include um, one of the two amendments that finally made it into this ordinance. Um, in, tw in October 2017, the executive issued a, de a determination of non-significance on these amendments. Um, so in front of you is a piece of legislation that would ad adopt two of the changes that came out of this process. Um, the first amends the goal that guide city regulations relate to off-street parking in order to um, clarify that um, supporting affordable housing is one of the um, things that go into play in council's consideration of affordable housing requirements. And the second um, amendment would remove two blocks from the Ballard Interbay North End Manufacturing Industrial Center to allow um, SPU to consider expanding um, in, onto those blocks um, as they prepare a future major institution master plan. And this is the Seattle Pacific University SPU as opposed to our own right. Seattle Public Utilities SPU. Right. We'll take up their master plan later. <laughs> well, I leave that to Councilmember Herbold's <laughs> capable hands. <laughs> right. Please continue. Uh, so that's that's all I have. Uh, and the commission has sent us a letter regarding um, this uh, set of discussions. So Vanessa, um, jump in. Thank you. Uh, so the planning commission uh, recommended approval of the text change to the land use goal six regarding um, the uh, reducing the cost of housing and increasing affordable housing by regulating off street parking. We recommended not to approve the change to the future land use map, map adjusting the BINMIC boundary. Uh, we recognize that the, um, as an institution, Seattle Public, Seattle Pacific University, uh, is different than uh, another proponent might be, a, pers uh, a private developer. Um, however, we, the Commission has remained steadfast in our recommendations to protect industrial lands and absent stronger policy or policy direction regarding how we maintain and preserve our industrial lands, uh, we recommended not approving this adjustment to the, bin, to the BINMIC and uh, are really look forward to engaging in a conversation about our industrial lands and um, land use policies to protect them. You know, I share that interest, Vanessa, in terms of a desire to have a more comprehensive review of the industrial lands policies. We have been waiting on that set of recommendations and reports to come out of the mayor's office for the last couple of years now. And um, absent, I think, that more comprehensive review, considering that this uh, amendment has been in discussion since um, mid 20. 16 or if not mid 2017, I can't remember which one. 2017. 2017. I think um, we, uh, it's incumbent upon us at some point to take some sort of action on some of these individual pieces. And in this one in particular, because it's a domino that needs to fall before Seattle Pub uh, Pacific University takes up their major institution master plan, there's a lot of confusion and lack of clarity. Um, I, I know that we are going to um, open up the public hearing just a little bit and hear from members of the public, but want to surface that I've received letters from several folks in support of this amendment, um, both from the representing the um, North Seattle industrial area as well as uh, nearby property owners. So um, we'll see about the controversy associated with it when we open up for the four folks who signed up to give a uh, comment during the public hearing in just a few minutes. But it seems to me like this is a relatively small change that's relatively non-controversial that I'd love for us to consider so that we can allow for the lengthy major institution master process to then take over for SPU. So, uh, but this is the chance for folks to ask questions and we certainly will have that chance again after the public hearing, but I wanted to see, Councilmember Herbold, looks like you wanna jump in. I do, um, we've um, received, um, as Chair Johnson has uh, indicated, a number of emails from uh, folks who are typically industrial land stakeholders in favor of this amendment and um, most of those emails have spoken to the fact that they don't believe that this change is precedent setting. Um, I would love to hear from both of you on that. Yeah, so there are two major institutions that abut industrial areas, um, University of Washington and Seattle Pacific University. SPU is the only one that abuts a, a manufacturing industrial center. Mm -hmm. So 
um, in terms of expanding an existing major institution boundary into uh, MIC, this is the only one that I know of. Go ahead. And uh, so from the Planning Commission's perspective, as I mentioned earlier, we recognize that this is a different situation than the usual um, future land use map adjustments that we see on an annual basis. Uh, we, do, we, we do have concerns about precedent setting. Um, we review the comp plan amendments every year, and every year we receive a number of requests to take land out of our manufacturing industrial centers. So we are remaining consistent with our past opinions and recommendations. I'll chime in too. I, I really um, respect not just the broad work that the Planning Commission does, but I appreciate your analysis on this one too. And I actually agree with everything you say. I'm inclined to disagree with the decision in the end. Um, uh, largely because this process seems to be going on indefinitely with no end in sight. And I, I, I believe we share the frustration that we do need to resolve some policy around what we're doing with our industrial land. And, um, you know, numerous times in the past, I've uh, agreed with the Planning Commission on holding off. And at some point, it feels like um, it's, I'm not sure what the metaphor would be, but it's an exercise in futility because um, it's not clear. Uh, it seemed like years ago we were months from getting it, and now it seems like we're further away from getting it now. And so I think that's a separate question on how we address that. I think the Planning Commission is um, totally appropriate to be pushing to resolve that issue because it does um, impact, you know, frankly, hundreds of other decisions we're trying to make around the city with our industrial lands and adjacent lands that without a clear policy or an updated policy, it's really hard to do. Um, I, because, as my colleagues have mentioned, um, we've heard, um, I think, unanimous support from folks involved in this to move forward. Um, sensitive to the precedent, I am inclined to, although I'm curious to hear what we hear in the public hearing, inclined to um, uh, support the amendment. Yeah, just a, an addition uh, to follow up. I think, um, although it is it is true that the review of industrial lands policy has gone on for um, a long time and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight, I want to make clear that um, uh, the decision that I'm likely to make on this is not about that. Um, it is about the unique nature of this because, um, and I just want to make that clear because I think lots of other proposals could come forward <laughs> and point to that being the reason why we should act on it. And so um, if I uh, vote in favor of it, it is because I think this is a, a, a unique request. Well, without further ado then, let's open up the public hearing on this um, council bill, which is Council Bill 119424. We've got four individuals who've signed up to give testimony this morning. Um, when I call your name, please come to one of the two microphones. Um, Alex Zimmerman is first, and Dan Martin is second. Hi. Yeah. My name is Alex Zimmerman. Yeah. What is I see for last 30 years, what is I live in Seattle, situation very unique. What has happened for last five years? make me absolutely sick. It's not sickness. It's a stupidity that as I never seen before from one civilized business and I'm businessman for all my life and business consultant. What is you did for last five years, situation very unique. You bring a problem is right now we, you want to fix this problem. Zoning. Everything what is you doing, I'm totally disagree because it's idiotic from beginning. Why you for five years never stop in Amazon? Never. I only one man who come to this place thousand times, more than two thousand times and talk about so need to be stopped, fix it all problem. But you very interesting, I call you a Nazi garbage rats who drink from fed get toilets. That's exactly who you are. In all council who here, no one have experience with business. Your mentality totally government mentality and government mentality is against people. You number one people enemy. Right now you're talking about zoning, zoning, zoning. But situation never will be go better. It will be worse, not matter what is you doing right now. Because from beginning, you don't stop in Amazon. Stop Amazon now. Nine council for many years, for last five years, no one talk stop Amazon. No one. Stop in Amazon. Ever 10% of Amazonian move down from downtown, we fix it all problem. You never doing this. Guys, you are number one people enemy. In my proposition, very simple. I'm against this stupidity, and I said before we not cleanse this dirty chamber from this mentally sick 
Nazi Gestapo principle, you know what is mean, what is control the city. Nothing will be changed. It's my professional opinion. The higher my dirty Führer. Dan Martin, you're going to be followed by Steve Gillespie and then Steve Rubstello. My name is Dan Martin. I serve as president of Seattle Pacific University, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Certainly uh, would move for an affirmative response and the proposal that is before you. This is really the result of years of conversation from the university's perspective with city officials, with elected officials, with members of the industrial community, and with members of our local community there in Queen Anne. And this is really the next step in a conversation. This is a part of the conversation that will certainly want to look at the future use of these particular parcels as we consider how we might leverage these particular parcels to accomplish what the broader community would like to see in terms of the future of our community and Seattle Pacific University, certainly to serve our mission, but then to serve the broader community so that all members of our community might flourish. When we were founded in 1891, Seattle was a relatively small city of 40,000 people. And we've been in partnership with the city ever since. As the city has grown and progressed, has become a world-class city, really a world-shaping and a world-defining city. The university has also grown in reputation and influence. And we want to continue our partnership with the city as we think about the future, as we think about being a future-facing university so that we might remain and continue to be a vital contributing member of this community and its future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Steve Gillespie and then Steve Rubstello. Good morning and thank you for uh, taking up this amendment proposal and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I echo what President Martin said. Uh, we really appreciate the work that has gone in uh, to, this, to this proposal and it became a formal proposal in mid-2017, but we've been working on it with the city for quite a few months, uh, maybe up to a year before that. So I really appreciate you bringing it forward today. It's been a lot of work on your staff members, Council Central staff, the Planning Commission, the executive side, SDCI, OCCD, et cetera. I, I want to address quickly what this amendment will do and what it will not do uh, to get at some of the Planning Commission concerns. This amendment adjusts the eastern boundary of the bin mix but it does not change the industrial designation or zoning of the property. That remains in place. And it does not establish a major institution overlay. As was mentioned by the committee, that can only happen after a major institution master planning process, which as you well know is a years long discussion with the community, with the institution, with the city, and with stakeholders. Uh, there'll be dozens of public meetings uh, associated with that request. This is not the end, approval of this amendment is not the end of the conversation. It is the beginning of the conversation about how best to use this land to faci facilitate quality jobs, to facilitate the continued uh, thriving of a 125-year-old institution in the city. So I urge you to vote in support of this amendment, recommend that the full council vote for it, and thank you again very much for your time. Steve? Industrial zoning is less and less and less in the city. And this may be a starter, but why start until you're sure that you really want to go that way? This is whiz-bang zoning with uh, up zone only that we've seen in the city for quite a while. I've never seen someone come here with a proposal for a down zone and this committee take them anything close to seriously. The zoning in this city appears to only be the starting point in one's dreams and desires. It should be capable of working both ways and especially when you have something as rare as industrial zoning. And it's vulnerable because its return is not extremely high compared to some of the other zonings. So if you put that at risk, you start looking at other opportunities, the valuations go up, and guess what? The industrial zoning tends to disappear for any of the other permitted uses. And we have seen very liberal 
uh, approach to the city to allowing ideas of greatness which may not be supported by the rest of the community. I hope that we will look very carefully at preserving our industrial land, what little is left, because Seattle should not have to have a bigger carbon in, input to the system by having everything transported from a long ways away and no industrial jobs in the city. So let's save what we've got. It's not much. That concludes the individuals who signed up to speak on the public hearing. So I will close the public hearing on Council Bill 119424. Um, colleagues, no surprises out of those four folks giving testimony. But I wonder, uh, Mr. Whitson, one of the things that we will have to do if we would like to vote on this today is to suspend the rules. We need to do that because of the comprehensive the comprehensive plan requirements about once a year updating. Can you just remind us a little bit about that process? Right. So under the Washington State Growth Management Act, council may amend the comprehensive plan only once a year. Um, this is the last PLEZ meeting of the year. And um, potentially, <laughs> this is likely the last <laughs> PLEZ meeting of the year. Um, and so if, the, if you do not act on this uh, bill at this meeting and don't hold a second meeting this month, um, then uh, these amendments would need to be held until you take up comprehensive plan amendments next year. So my recommendation, colleagues, given um, the public testimony that we heard during the public hearing and what we have received in advance of today's meetings is to suspend the rules and take action on um, this today, which is not something we usually do on the same day as a public hearing, but is something we do when there is some time constraints and not um, significant overwhelming opposition. So uh, I'd like to start the process of consideration by uh, moving to suspend the rules to vote on Council Bill 119424 on the same day as a public hearing. Second. Further discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So none are opposed. So let's talk a little bit about it. Any concerns or questions that came up after the public hearing that folks want to surface? Um, no, I appreciate the comments from folks. I think that I, um, I'm i still supportive of the amendments as they are. Um, I want to just highlight that there was um, another amendment that had been proposed, which was to bring in a transportation project list into the comprehensive plan, um, which is a required step um, towards doing transportation impact fees. But the that amendment had been, uh, is, uh, the uh, determination of non-significance for SEPA analysis has been challenged by um, uh, some lawyers, so that um, is not ripe for discussion now, so that will have to wait until 2019. Um, so that work continues, but I think these two amendments uh, make a lot of sense, and I appreciate your work on this, Councilmember Johnson. I appreciate the Planning Commission and your list, and I also appreciate public comment. Councilmember Herbal. Yeah, um, just to add to that, um, I wanted to ask Lish um, if we were going to um, consider that other comp plan amendment next year, the um, addition of the um, transportation project list uh, necessary to consider a future transportation impact fee program. Um, when would that comp plan uh, process begin? When, when would we be likely to vote on it next year? Just trying to get a sense of um, when we would hope for that appeal to be resolved. Um, so I think the, we'll know more after December 16th when there's a meeting with the hearing examiner about um, that appeal and the process and the timeline. Um, but the intent is to act on comprehensive plan amendments at the same time that you are acting on mandatory housing affordability code changes mm -hmm. because uh, many of those changes rely on changing urban village boundaries. Um, and so the comprehensive plan should be consistent with any changes to urban village boundaries that you make. All right, so that's springtime. Yeah. Um, and normally for comp plan amendments, we have to do a uh, resolution in advance naming them. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so we still have the resolution that uh, was adopted in the summer of 2017. Okay, so we're working that, off, of the, off of that one. Yeah. All right, just wanted to make sure that we, if, if we did need to pass another resolution, um, you know, whether or not we could, we needed to, or we were able to include um, 
ideas that are being appealed. But if we are, we're, the, the, two, uh, the 2016 resolution is still uh, valid for uh, 2019 uh, deliberation. Yes, you'll have the opportunity um, this coming spring and summer to pass the next resolution that lays out a new set of work on the comp plan. Oh, so we will have to pass another resolution? No, uh, after the impact fees and mandatory housing affordability and industrial lands changes were all called out in the 2017 amendment um, resolution, so we're still working on Sorry. completing that work. All right. And we traditionally have had that um, process. We took 2018 off under the hope that we were going to be considering MHA, but because that didn't come to fruition, we hope that we'll take up that work again post the MHA vote. But the things that you outlined, Councilmember Herbal, just to reiterate, are included within the existing work plan, so there shouldn't be a problem for us Fantastic. to consider this. Okay. So, without further ado, then, I would like to move to adopt Council Bill 119424. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Um, that uh, Council Bill is adopted out of committee and okay. will be back in front of us at the full Council on Monday the 10th. We'll take a brief reprieve from you, Mr. Whitson, but have you back here in just a, a minute to talk about the right. Major Institution Master Plan. Thank, Thank you. you for all your good work on this. I really appreciate it. Agenda item number five. Mr. Ahn, will you read that one to the record while I ask presenters to please come forward? Agenda item five, Council Bill 119398, an ordinance relating to land use and zoning, amending the title of Chapter 23.52, Subchapter 1 of the Seattle Municipal Code, and amending Sections 23.52.004 and 23.52.008 of the SMC, and repealing Section 23.52.002 of the SMC to implement the Comprehensive Plan Adopted Level of Service Standard. Thank you very much. Um, let's do some brief introductions. Mr. McConaughey. Good morning. I'm Eric McConaughey on the Council Central Staff. Gordon Clowers, SDCI. And I'm Emily Ellers with SDAT. Michael Hubner with the Office of Planning and Community Development. So while we figure out the technology necessary to put the um, presentation up on the big screen, I just want to take a minute to remind folks about um, this particular amendment. Um, way back when, when we adopted the comprehensive plan in 2016, one of the things that we did was we set aside parts of the city where we wanted to see a particular level of transit ridership and service um, and uh, asked the Department of Construction and Inspections and, and Planning Department and uh, Department of Transportation to come back to us with um, how we could implement those objectives, particularly within new residential developments. We have seen as a city a lot of success through the statewide commuter production program at getting people out of their cars and onto other modes of transportation than single occupancy vehicles in their workplace, but we've struggled to replicate that in the residential environment. So this new set of tools that we're gonna walk through today um, will allow for us to require developers in certain sections of the city to offer a wider set of options to their residents as part of meeting their service standards that we expect uh, as we contemplate growing, um, particularly around our transit centers throughout the city. So with that sort of forte, forefronts, intro, something, I'm a little rusty today. I'll turn it over to you, Michael, to kick off the presentation. So long as it's not foreshadowing, I think we're okay. Uh, good morning, Th uh, thanks for, um, uh, for having us here this morning. I, I, I'm with the Office of Planning and Community Development, so this, uh, uh, the amendments that are before you today are uh, n n a flow out of, uh, the, especially the uh, level of service standard and concurrency requirements flow out of the city's comprehensive plan. So I'm gonna take the lead on presenting those requirements, but I'm here with uh, construction and inspections and uh, Department of Transportation because the implementation and enforcement of those standards will flow through those departments. Um, we're going to be talking about two sub-chapters of uh, uh, Seattle Municipal Code 23.52. Uh, 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 Sub-chapter one deals with the transportation level of service project review system. That's the main topic we want to cover. There is a sub-chapter two in the ordinance 
that is a, think of this as a technical update to uh, clarifying which projects will be subject to uh, transportation impact studies uh, relative to CEPA thresholds. These are not directly related. Uh, while they are in the same ordinance, I'm going to have a, a, the DCI staff speak to the second one uh, especially. Uh, also important to note that the uh, LOS standards and the concurrency requirements that we'll be talking about are just one tool in our toolbox to address trans transportation impacts of new development in the city. We have uh, SEPA review transportation impact studies themselves and potentially in the future tools such as impact fees that the council may be considering. These are all separate, separate and complementary tools. So starting with the comprehensive plan, uh, as noted, this re reflects a policy shift in the comprehensive plan that um, addresses uh, a variety of policy aims through our level of service standards. Level of service standards are, are merely a technical measure of our system performance. That's a kind of a wonky way of talking about how well are we uh, providing for mobility within the city for people and for, for goods. This is required uh, uh, aspect of the comprehensive plan under the Growth Management Act. And prior to 2016, when we updated the comprehensive plan, we had defined LOS level of service using what are called screen lines, uh, essentially looking at the volume of traffic uh, relative to the capacity of our arterials at various measurement points throughout the city. Uh, the, uh, this was a highly uh, automobile-centric uh, measure, and it implied um, potential uh, fixes to exceeding that uh, the capacity of our roadways that addressed uh, only uh, uh, or primarily automobiles. But uh, the 2016 update to the plan was an opportunity to update our LO approach to level of service to address a variety of uh, 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 policies in the comprehensive plan. One was the, stre the emphasis on moving people and not just vehicles. Another is our uh, uh, emphasis on uh, working toward our climate change goals of becoming carbon neutral as a city by 2050, and with the transportation sector being such an important and large piece of our greenhouse gas emissions, moving people away from uh, a, a reliance on drive alone trips, uh, single occupancy vehicles was one way that the city can have a major impact on our greenhouse gas emissions and setting the LOS standards in a way that shapes development and provides a measure of how we are doing as a city that tells us how well we are shifting those trips to those other modes was, was seen to be a better way of approaching LOS. The screen line approach in practice uh, provided us a, a, a measure to compare new development when it was proposed. We had tra tra uh, transportation traffic impact studies that showed how many trips were generated by new projects, and we were able to compare that to what we knew about the arterial capacity at those screen lines. In practice, this was largely a paper exercise. Uh, we rarely, if ever, exceeded those uh, capacity numbers that were in, in, this, in the screen line uh, uh, ratios that were established in the comp plan, and it didn't provide for any meaningful change to either development or actions the city was taking to uh, shape travel and provide options for people within the city. So in the 2016 update, after uh, uh, a, a long process of uh, interdepartmental work and a work with a consultant to uh, build upon the modeling that was done for the environmental impact statement in the plan, we arrived at an approach that was based on mode share. Uh, in other words, the share of trips that are made during PM peak, er peak hour time from 3 to 6 p.m. by drive alone trips by single occupancy vehicles as a measure that tells us the most in a simple and direct way about how our transportation, transportation system is functioning. We do have an idea of how many single occupancy vehicle trips our system can uh, accommodate, and by looking at the mode share and uh, combining that with what we know about growth that's expected in the city out to 2035, we set targets for each of eight sectors in the city. And this slide shows you the targets for each of those eight geographic sectors for the share of trips that will be made by drive alone during the PM peak period in 2035, this represents a 2 to 5 percent decrease in each of those geographic sectors. And as we implement development standards, which I'll talk about shortly, that help shape 
uh, growth and development to reinforce progress toward these goals. We'll be able to monitor progress uh, citywide and within each of these sectors using tra uh, travel uh, survey data that's available from the Puget Sound Regional Council. So this slide illustrates some of the thinking behind uh, essentially that aim to emphasize moving people rather than vehicles and making the most efficient use of our limited right-of-way. Uh, you'll see here uh, some of the assumptions that w went into setting the new o LOS standard relating to the growth expected by 2035 and uh, how in modeling how our arterials are impacted by that growth and the trips that come from new housing and from new businesses, that if those trips are made by people driving alone it occupies a great deal of our uh, limited capacity in our right-of-way, a right-of-way that, that in a built-out city cannot easily, feasibly, from a financial, environmental, or community impact standpoint, be expanded. We, we are, quite frankly, limited in our ability to add new vehicle lanes. So making efficient use of those is a, is a priority of the plan. And you can see in this example illustrated here, traveling by bus takes up much less of the right-of-way per person moving through, the right, through, through our existing transportation system. So how this works under the new uh, LOS standard is projects come, uh, are proposed, uh, both residential and non-residential throughout the city. Uh, we first, uh, and, and, and Part of this is covered, I, I should say, what you see on this slide here is covered in the ordinance. We also have a joint director's rule, which I'll talk about shortly, which, which uh, describes the tools available to developers. But first off is to identify which projects are subject to review at what level. And the ordinance sp uh, stipulates that projects above a certain size are subject to the LOS project review. Roughly, the size uh, parameters here uh, translate into at least 30 trips generated during that peak hour period on a, on a given weekday. So that would be uh, residential projects in excess of 30 dwelling units, non-residential at 4,000 square feet of a floor area or greater, or industrial projects at 30,000 square feet of floor area or, or, or greater. Those are the size thresholds that would then be subject to uh, additional review. Uh, on top of that, uh, based on our modeling and analysis for the comp plan, we know that projects that are located in certain locations in the city that have uh, very rich transit options and choices for traveling uh, other than single occupancy vehicle and are also close to a variety of goods and services and jobs, um, and what we identified as those areas that are the, have the highest uh, ability to um, attract non-SOV trips are our urban centers, shown in blue on this map, our hub urban villages, so shown in green, and a half mile walk distance to light rail stations. And what you see are the, are the existing and then uh, soon to be uh, to come on service light rail stations within the city. Obviously, that system will expand in the future. Uh, projects located in those areas substantially will contribute to us achieving those uh, SOV share goals in the future. And so those projects would be then have satisfied the development standard by locating within uh, any of those three geographies. Please, Councilmember Herbold. So are you saying that projects um, within those areas don't, won't receive a review, an LOS review, because they're already deemed to meet the standards? Uh, essentially, the LOS review will start with a, uh, a locational determination. So when a um, master use permit uh, it comes in the door, yeah. it, it will, would include, uh, at, at the, the first cut would be, where is this project located and does it fall within any of these three areas? Thank you. Yeah, it, and that is a performance standard in and of itself. It's a locational performance standard. For projects that are located outside of those three areas within the city, there's a menu of options that essentially are choices that the, the developer has that would shape the add um, features to the development itself or have the developer pay for or contribute to public improvements or other uh, services to the uh, tenants of those buildings that would per make it easier and cheaper for their, their tenants to use a variety of tra uh, travel options other than SOV. So those, that menu is uh, in a preliminary draft uh, joint director's rule that's uh, 
uh, uh, coming out of the DCI and, and SDOT. Uh, they work closely with us to draft that rule. So after you uh, would adopt an ordinance, uh, that the formal draft would be released and uh, based on, certainly based on your feedback and what we hear up till then, there'll be a comment period and then that will be finalized and that director's rule will guide implementation. What the preliminary draft says right now is that it provides a, a, a menu of five options one is to construct new sidewalks in the project area. A second option would be to construct new curb ramps in the project area. So both of those are features of our pedestrian network. A third would be to reduce the number of parking spaces in the project. Uh, now that wouldn't change the uh, parking requirements uh, uh, that, that are currently in effect, but rather provide an incentive for less parking than might otherwise have been uh, provided within uh, the current requirements in the city. Providing a mix of uses in the project. A mix of uses would bring residences and uh, the kinds of services and, and, and goods that residents might make trips by, by auto to, to reach into uh, walking distance and essentially uh, reduce the number of vessel trips generated by the project. And finally, have the uh, developer contribute to subsidizing bus passes through the Metro ORCA passport program and uh, uh, this would provide, make it easier for tenants to, um, uh, to um, access transit, use transit for making more trips. And essentially, this is a suite of transportation demand management tools, similar to what you would see uh, for an em employer-based program to reduce commute, commute trips, but would apply to both residential and other types, smaller, uh, smaller non-residential projects throughout the city. This is a suite of tools that we can certainly and would be monitoring their use of over time and could adjust uh, uh, based on how those tools are being used, how what we know about the data that show how our mode uh, share is shifting over time. And finally, if none of these tools work for a given developer, there's a choice that a, a project uh, developer could propose, an additional tool, as long as they demonstrate that that tool through their own uh, traffic impact studies show would reduce SOV trips by at least 4%. So a modest decrease in the number of trips that would be generated uh, through drive alone in the project. So Michael, this might be a question for you, but it might also be a question for Gordon. I mean, fundamentally what we're trying to achieve here is a new set of requirements for developers in a large majority of the city that would require them to really think through how their residents or the tenants of their buildings will get to or from that place in the evening peak period. How many of these requirements that you have on this list uh, are in place today? And what's the difference between the tools that we require of developers today and what would happen if we were to adopt the bill uh, before recognizing there's also a director's rule and implementation that will come along with it? I, I've done a lot of talking. I'm going to ask Gordon Clowers from a, a DCI uh, to spe speak to that and how this would functions right now in, ter in terms of our requirements. Well, I would say that these tools are not available today um, and, and in the sense of um, an upfront action that can be uh, worked into the project plan itself. So um, if a developer were to come in today and not meet the goals and standards that we have included in the comp plan for you know, the number of folks that are coming to and from their development by single occupancy vehicle, there's really no way for us to address that issue today. But this menu uh, that we've got in front of us would allow for the Department of Construction and Inspections to effectively require changes to the development before it gets built that would bring it into line with what our expectations are for a city around the mode share for that particular building. Uh, that's largely true. Um, if I would have to say if there is a particular um, shortfall or significant problem with a sidewalk in front mm -hmm. of a or, or near, near a project that we could require a incremental mm -hmm. uh, improvement of that kind or, or a, um, a street uh, or traffic signal adjustment, but um, that's a little bit different category. Great. Please, Councilman Verbal. Um, so in the menu of transportation management tools, there are a number of different items. Um, most of them require an additional in investment from the developer. Um, one of them does not. <laughs> one of them would result in a savings to the developer. Um, and I'm concerned about how that particular menu might incentivize um, the option of um, 
that results in a savings in um, development cost to the developer, and it's the question about the reducing the number of parking spaces in the project. So how, if, if our goal is to um, get more investments that, um, that incentivize um, fewer uh, single occupancy vehicle trips, uh, why would we include in this menu of options um, an item that, um, that, that doesn't add to our uh, transportation infrastructure in a way that incentivizes um, other modes of transportation? Um, it just seems like developers will gravitate to the option that will reduce their development costs and we won't get the investments um, that we need for our system. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, there could be different motivations from different applicants to provide a little bit more parking or not provide as much parking. Uh, and I think it's a real possibility that, that they will choose other non-parking improvements. Um, that said, however, there, there is a direct sort of relationship between um, how much parking is available and, and what the likely uh, resident uh, who will be there, uh, what their profile will be in terms of car ownership and uh, most likely uh, a, a lesser parked projects would tend to, to have a, more households with people that don't own cars, and that in itself will start to shift um, the the uh, trip generation. And we've had this conversation before, and I think there is definitely anecdotal information and some limited statistical information that supports um, what you're saying, but I don't think, I think the verdict's still out of whether or not, um, you know, what percentage of people who live in buildings without parking are parking on the street and taking up street space and whether or not it's actually encouraging people mm -hmm. um, to um, to not own cars and to um, take transit. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I have concerns about this mix of tools. I also have um, concerns about the fact that uh, we have set um, uh, standards for when we reduce parking uh, within frequent transit areas, and this seems like this would um, allow for reduced parking beyond our current standards outside of frequent transit areas as, as well. And I think that might be a pretty big policy issue, if I'm understanding it correctly. Explain how this, yeah. that, how, how does this relate to our existing standards? Does this right. change those, or is it just within the uh -huh. flexibility they already have? It's within the flex flexibility we already have. It does not change the existing standards. Within the existing standards, there are a range of choices that developers have in terms of how many spaces they would provide within a project. So what the, what this does, it, it, it indeed provides, in a sense, uh, I'd say a modest in incentive within that within that range to be closer to to, to the minimum, and that varies depending on what the location and what standard applies throughout the city. I would say in response to the question that, that developers are going to be, even absent this new requirement, are going to be setting parking as they see makes sense for their project within the envelopes set by our, sent by our standards. I would say that this incentive would most likely uh, be uh, used by a developer where there was, uh, where they saw that there was a, a potential oversupply of, of of parking within the project, and the project could very well still work within uh, and still meet the, the 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 this requirement. I also think that a large number of projects, even outside of the uh, exempt areas, the hub urban the hub urban villages, the urban centers, the transit station areas, or would already be meeting this requirement because they would have that flexibility within existing standards to provide parking, less parking within within our standards. But this does not change the standards. Um, one thing that we can and will do is collect data on how this is being implemented over time. And then also, because we know what the standards are and that there is, um, it's evident that many projects are, are, are using the new standards to provide uh, less parking within projects, that we have a very active and, and robust set of curbside management tools to address any spillover or neighborhood impacts um, that, may, that may be resulting al already within our parking standards. This would not ch change that equation, really. We still have that set of tools, but we can collect data on how many projects are using this, and um, 
and what difference it really makes on the parking side, I think is a relevant question. Uh, a couple of people were pulling their microphones closer. The first one I saw was Gordon. Is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Uh, no. Okay, yeah. Eric? Uh, just very briefly, by clarification, that uh, it just reiterating uh, what Michael said, that this, this menu of uh, options here are in the joint director's rule, which is still to be rolled out. So um, the, uh, the, the implementation of the changes in the rules uh, in the law and the bill would rely on this being uh, established. So um, if that's helpful in terms of uh, your discussion and decision making about um, you know, this bill and how it moves forward, I just bring that up. For the thoughts? Yeah, um, so the, but the director's rule is not coming back to council, correct? The director's rule is handled administratively. There's a public process. Uh, council certainly, uh, um, um, either by uh, conveying uh, what constituents are communicating to the offices or council members' own opinions can certainly participate in that, but it's uh, by definition handled administratively. And the, um, the legislation before us um, says that the joint director's rule will provide a menu of options, so that is that is at least at least these items um, in the toolbox will be included in the director's rule. So I just want to go back to my um, earlier question, um, just for for clarification's sake. Um, so the ability to reduce parking spaces in a project um, that that will be able to happen where. I just want to make sure that we're not ta making a major policy change um, within a director's rule. I, I, I fully, and, and, and this is a complicated topic because you have intersecting uh, requirements and, and ordinances that deal with this. This does, n right now, projects have latitude to provide a range of parking in, within the project. Uh, and this in ordinance. Some places. In some Not places, no, right, no, 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 no. That's that, the question. This, well, there's a range everywhere. There's a ra there's a, ra a range of requirements throughout the city right right now. This menu, uh, the 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 concurrency LOS ordinance and the menu that uh, guides the implementation of it does not change those requirements. Right now, developers have the sa have that latitude to provide parking at a different at various levels, and this does not ch change what they can do. Um, I can add a little bit too. Um, in the areas where there is a minimum parking requirement for residential uses, which is generally one space per dwelling unit, um, that requirement is still there and the choice by the developers to voluntarily hold themselves to that one space per dwelling unit uh, minimum, which becomes essentially the maximum that they provide for that project. Um, in cases where there is no parking requirement at all, um, the, the, the choice is to provide m no more than 0.6 spaces per dwelling unit. Yeah, my, so, so my question that's, is... That's what the data shows us in recent projects, is that what you're saying? Uh, that, those are the, the voluntary choices that we have uh, drafted in the menu here. Oh, got it. And largely speaking, the uh, 0.6 sp spaces per unit will uh, cover uh, an actual parking demand for uh, in-city uh, multifamily uh, projects. So in areas where there is a minimum parking required, um, minimum parking requi um, mm -hmm. number of spaces required, uh, this tool would allow what? Uh -huh. uh, to fulfill that upfront option, the developer would choose to provide no more than one space per dwelling unit. Um, so this, this would not affect those areas at all? I thought I heard you say they could voluntarily choose to do something else in those areas. I think that it doesn't change the floor of what's required, so there's still a minimum parking requirement. You have to do at least that much where there is a minimum requirement. We're just incentivizing developers to provide closer to the minimum than they may otherwise have chosen to do so. Got it. So if there's a, a project where there's a one per unit requirement, a developer may voluntarily choose to do two units per requirement. And we would say to be in compliance with this, you could choose to do a menu of things, including reduce your parking to one per unit instead of the two per unit. Yeah, provide the minimum. Still meeting the legal minimum. We're not changing that, but saying, why don't you voluntarily come close to that? That's correct. And I, I believe a lot of the rationale for that is based on our goals and objectives about mode share in the neighborhoods, and in particular, how folks are getting around and how that impacts you know, writ large, our city's goals around climate. Now, Councilmember Herbold, you and I disagree on what the 
literature might say about if you build it and they will come related to parking development. But generally, I think um, the example that you are concerned about has been well highlighted by folks here. And so to, to your specific example, Councilmember O'Brien, that would be the place where I think we would see people um, getting asked by the Department of Construction and Inspections to reduce the number of parking spaces in the project. What is very unlikely is to see somebody who's already building at a point six, developing a level of standard that is a one space per unit and then coming into SDCI and saying, oh, the best way I can do this is to go from one to a point six. I, I, I don't see folks gaming the system in that way, but we are going to be tracking the data and we're going to be analyzing the director's rule to see whether or not that is uh, what's coming through. And I think that this menu of options that I'm most excited about allows for us to really prioritize a set of infrastructure investments um, in curb ramps and sidewalks that we don't currently have the resources for now. And secondly, things like subsidized bus passes, which are not a tool that is available to us to require developers to subsidize bus passes for their development. So the residents in their units would get a, a menu of options that don't exist today, which I think is really important. Thank you for the joint effort <laughs> on your patience for helping me understand. No, no, complicated set of issues with a lot of intersection uh, overlapping. I know we have other important things to get to today, but can um, I, I don't have clarity on um, what triggers this review. So you talked about size, so projects above a certain size, 30 units or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and obviously, um, uh, if they're within the geographies lined out early in the review, they would say, you're already qualified, so we're done. But is there, what are the other characteristics that, that would cause folks to go to this menu? Is every project oversized look at this, or do you look at a project and say, oh, it looks like your project's gonna generate more trips than we'd like to see? No, it would it would be categorical uh, with respect to the size and location of the of, of, of the project. Uh, the the important element of flexibility here certainly is the the option for the developer to make uh, to propose uh, an alternative tool. That is, if there's a uh, if there are projects that are un have unique characteristics that may need to be accounted for. There's certainly through the uh, d development review process as they come in with them up. Uh, can certainly address some of those unique characteristics, but they but that would be part of that review. It would really be impinging on the developer to demonstrate how they are their project is consistent with what is expected under the uh, director. So in a so a, a, a project that's large enough to to go through review that then is outside of the urban village hub urban village or urban center hub urban village or um, light rail zones, um, if that project. Um, is in an area that has no parking minimums and they're providing 0.6 or fewer, they would then automatically qualify. And if it was a project that um, had parking minimums and they were, um, not they were not providing more than one parking spot, they would also qualify. And so the only folks that would go to the other bullet points would be someone who's providing more than those parking outside those zones larger. And then we'd say either reduce your parking closer to the minimums or try one of these other tools. Th that, that's correct. There may, also, there may be other elements of, the, of, of proposed projects that satisfy the requirements as well, such as the mix of uses. Okay, um, so then, got it. Right, so it's a demonstrating what is the, as proposed, what does the project entail? Does it satisfy any, any of the tools on the menu? And if not, then, um, uh, choose one of the uh, one of those yeah. this is helpful to understand how it impacts um, going back to the bigger policy I wanted to say that I really support this um, uh, I believe that when we have a, a level of service around um, you know vehicle throughput at intersections um, as we tend to do in our society more broadly I believe that continues to encourage folks to say, as we grow, we need to widen roads and make bigger intersections and more turn lanes and all those things, which as you all mentioned, you know, at, at our city, we're, we're just not capable of doing anymore. But it also, you know, in other jurisdictions, it, it encourages folks the answer to the solution to the problem we see is bigger roads, which starts to reinforce a system which ends up where, um, as I just was alerted to, carbon emissions in the United States hit a record level in 2018. And we have to be doing some different things if we want to address that. And so I don't think this is going to radically change it, but I do think the focus on um, what we care about in these projects is 
um, how many single occupancy tips are you, is are your projects going to generate? And we want to do everything we can to minimize that. Um, and the the proposals, you know, the alternatives here to encourage folks to subsidize transit. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do to continue to provide a robust enough transit service that we can meet demand. And we're struggling with that at the moment. But um, we can talk about transportation impact fees at another date on that and how that might help. But um, I think the the gist of this makes a lot of sense. And we've got one more slide to get through before we open up the public uh, uh, hearing. And hopefully a very, very quick one. So shifting gears entirely to part two, the subchapter two of 2352, I'll turn to Gordon to explain to you what this does. Okay, so this does have a relationship to the SEPA infill thresholds that we have applied for urban centers, um, made those a fairly high level uh, threshold. Um, this uh, requirement has been in uh, the code for a while, but it uh, allows for and requires a transportation impact study for developments that are below that high threshold, but above where the um, older low threshold was. So in essence, we're saying that we want to keep um, looking at transportation impacts um, for projects of those sizes and have the ability to mitigate impacts as they arise. And the corrections here are mainly just to um, update the headings and um, make sure that the wording of this uh, threshold table is correct. So um, uh, in other le legislation, we've uh, created in certain areas where projects come in, if they're below a certain threshold, they're exempt from going through SEPA. If I understand this correctly, we're just making clear, but we can still require you to go through some transportation analysis independent of the, the more uh -huh. robust SEEP analysis? Yes, and, and this applies specifically to urban centers at this point. Okay. And, and then in other areas, the other typical SEPA thresholds are still in place. Right. Still in my talking points, Council Member O'Brien. Good, <laughs> good job of teeing that one up. Um, okay, any further thoughts from folks here on the staff side of the table? Council members, anything you want to ask before we open up the public hearing on this one? Okay. So without further ado, I'd like to open the public hearing on Council Bill 119398 um, related to the comprehensive plan adopted level of service standard. We've got four individuals who've signed up to give public testimony at this public hearing. We're going to start with Alex Zimmerman and then Megan Cruz. <laughs> Mr. Zimmerman. Thank you. Hi. Mm, I'm against this plan, and I explain to you why. Like a business consultant and professional businessman, I have two points what is I want to deliver it to you, how we can make life better for the 700,000 idiots who live in this city. This is exactly what's happened. Number one, this whole plan what is con right now under transportation is very simple. It's controlled by sound transit. Even I call this a Nazi social democratic mafia. The council in this room all under this plan, under this sound transit, Nazi social democratic mafia. So point number one, we need to clean this dirty chamber from this council who make life miserable and go worse and worse for every day and never will be better. It's very important. It's number one. Number two, my recommendation. So right now, I don't blame you, this council, for 100 percent. But I speak to you, Seattle Emerald Degenerate, super smart freaking idiot. Professional, educate, city, don't understand what has happened here. Why? Why people who come here talking about Tylenol? Yeah, it's a typical recommendation when body is so sick, you need a huge operation. Look this. It's a rabbit, a sheep, come in a talk. Yes, we need Tylenol for fix this problem, and another Tylenol for fix this problem. Body dying, Seattle dying. I have experience with Soviet Union transportation, communist transportation. Guys, you make unique situation. You make from American chocolate Russian shit. It's unique situation. I don't have analogy like this in America. So right now, I'll speak to you. Stand up, America. Clean this dirty chamber from this Nazi pig in Cretina. Ms. Cruz, you're going to be followed by Judy Gibbs and then Steve Verbstello. OK. Uh, I think it's a good idea to expand the ways we look at transportation level of service. But this legislation needs more work. It, it 
has big emissions and it doesn't do uh, anything for the downtown core, which is where we're facing a real crisis. I would recommend that we take this legislation and uh, send it back for further study of its assumptions, the area of coverage, and how it measures traffic, not just by SOVs, but other factors. Um, Seattle is approaching the period of maximum constraint, and this won't measure that critical volume versus capacity that tells you where the choke points are gonna be. Um, it also exempts downtown towers, essentially, from having to comply with any mitigation, just because they're within so many blocks of a light rail. Um, there's uh, also the problem that it won't gauge what's happening with new developments in its own neighborhood. The new measurement is just over a wide, a wide swath of downtown Lake Union and West Capitol Hill, and the measurement will come every two years in a household survey put out by the Puget Sound uh, Regional Council. That's really not gonna give us the data we need to do this right. If we're gonna do density, we have to be responsible about it. Um, one example, and I've got this, I hope you see this um, uh, illustration, is an area that we're gonna have problems with and that this LOS won't address. On Virginia Street between First Avenue and Fifth Avenue, on either side of the block, there will be 12 new towers going up in the next few years, if they're all approved. It will add 6,500 new residents, 2,500 new parking stalls, and thousands of more people living and working and servicing these buildings. Uh, if, we don't, if we don't have some measure of what this is gonna do to the street, uh, we can't ask these developers for mitigation. They're already exempt. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Uh, Judy Gibbs, followed by Steve Rupsella. When I ca it came here today, I knew we were going to be talking about parking and removing parking, and I didn't understand it was just asking the developers to uh, put in less parking. Uh, I'm going to have to ch sort of change my comments on the fly, but I am going to, um, I do want to comment on this. First of all, if, they, if people can be, if people are being required to reduce the amount of parking, all that means is that a lot of people are going to be parking out on the street and homes that have depended on street parking because they don't have anything else, uh, you know, homeowners are going to be fighting for it. Uh, I think my real point in this and the reason I came down today is that people seem to think that we can force transit use by reducing parking availability. And I challenge people to get from Magnolia to the U District after 5.50 p.m. weekdays or any time on a weekend or holiday uh, because of lack of a transit system. We need, we need an adequate transit system is what I'm saying. Um, right now, if I want to go to the U District after 5.50 in the evening or any time on the weekend, I have to go downtown, take a bus and change and go back. And it takes two hours to get to the U District, two hours each way. Um, if we had a transit system like Vancouver, BC, where, which has sky trains and the bus lines crisscrossing, it would be wonderful. Um, I would love to take transit any place I go. I can't. Uh, I, I, ta I take the bus when I go downtown, but I won't take it any place else. But I, I would. I think what you're doing is putting the cart before the horse. Thank you. You have to improve transit availability Thank and you, then cut, on, cut the parking. Mr. Upsell. I concur. But I also think that uh, I can go back by my initial remark. Here we go again. I hear all these promises about who would game the system. Developers never gamed the system in Seattle. You know, we, it's so simple. They love complex because it's always reinterpreted. And I think that a nice chart should go with this telling what the limits are. Because right now, you're passing something which will be kind of not very specific. 
And when it gets specific, it may not look a whole lot like what you have just passed. That's been the history in Seattle about zoning. Uh, a good build out, a maximums, a minimums chart to show what limits the director can work in. Because right now, we don't have those. We also have problems of the size of the stalls that are parking that's available. More and more people are buying larger vehicles. Stalls don't seem to be reflecting that. I've seen many stalls that the largest vehicles probably, well, they won't go in. And those that will, how do you open the doors to get in and out of the vehicle? So uh, that's why some people park on the street. Another reason why people park on the street is, let's face it, if you can do it without paying, and uh, you pay one way or another in buildings, especially of any size for parking, it doesn't require the city to require that because of the lack of parking. And another thing that has bothered me is you are choking the arteries of the city. I have seen arterials getting smaller and smaller. Thank you, Mr. Ripstall. Uh, that concludes the folks who've signed up to testify in the public hearing. So I'm gonna close the public hearing on Council Bill 119398. Um, colleagues, uh, sure. I'm sorry, we're in the middle of the, yeah, thank, no, thank you, no, thank you. Miss, I'm sorry, Ms. Dinch, I'm, I'm okay, I, copy, Judy. okay. So, um, so per the conversation that we had with Lish Whitson earlier today, this is one of those issues that um, does require uh, action relatively quickly. And so I uh, wanna offer the opportunity here for folks to disagree, but I think that this one has been two years in the making, so would ask, um, that we consider suspending the rules today to allow for us to vote on this on the same day as a public hearing. Um, what, what is the, um, uh, is this another thing that has to be passed by the end of the year? That's my understanding, but I, I defer to central staff to discuss this further. Um, uh, well, the sooner this passes, the sooner the process of developing the development, the joint rule can happen, and then the sooner it can be impl implemented by the city. So, my question yeah. is, no, it doesn't have to be passed by the end of the year. No, this this doesn't get uh, sort of bundled in uh, under the same sorts of rules with passing a comp plan once a year and that sort of thing. I think um, if there is any sense of it being um, timely, it's uh, that uh, it does implement the comprehensive plan, which is a requirement of the Growth Management Act, that what the policies that we have in the comp plan are reflected in our code. This is the executive's uh, proposal to make that happen, and it's been uh, sort of two years in the making. So that's that's just by way of context and timing. I, I apologize, colleagues. I thought that this was related to the earlier comp plan issue and required us to take action before the end of the year. Otherwise, we'd have to delay. But so my, my thinking, I, I didn't hear any public comment that will change my mind, but um, I will defer to our rules, and if, if either of my colleagues um, would prefer not to suspend the rules and give it another committee meeting, I would certainly support that. I'm just, uh, it's, as a person who, uh, who has responsibility for chairing a committee where things come up sometimes that um, there's some urgency around, um, I'm kind of a stickler myself uh, for when I suspend the rules and, and when I don't, and um, I suspend the rules when there's like an actual um, time emergency, and so uh, just for my own consistency's sake, I, I wouldn't support suspending the rules in this instance. I'd, I'd stand with Council Member Hubbard on that. Okay, so uh, in that case, then we will, I, I won't make a formal motion since it looks like it would lose anyway, and what we will say is we'll, we've closed the public hearing on this topic, and we will anticipate taking this back up again either at our meeting in December, um, December the 19th, or after the first of the year. Uh, just one small bit of business that I'd like to sort of insert here. Thank you for letting me jump in. Um, there are some just technical, essentially typographic um, uh, changes that need to be made to the map that is in the, the code that could be taken the next time this comes before the committee. But just in terms of letting the public know, it's uh, they're, they're listed, they're shown in the memorandum. Uh, there's no um, concern in the part of the central staff to uh, make these corrections, but I thought I would just bring it up now as part of the public record. And then when the committee takes this up again, uh, there could be, uh, uh, central staff would recommend, you know, moving to make that amendment. Understood. Yep. Questions about that, colleagues? Okay. Um, thank you all. We'll look forward to discussing this again at a future date.
So let's move on to agenda items number six and seven. Noah, will you again please read the abbreviated titles of those two agenda items into the record? Agenda items six and seven, clerk file 314346, application of the University of Washington to prepare a new major institution master plan for the University of Washington Seattle campus at 4000 15th Avenue Northeast and Council Bill 119426, an ordinance relating to land use and zoning, granting conditional approval of the University of Washington 2018 campus master plan, Seattle campus master plan, and amending chapter 23.32 of the Seattle Municipal Code. Thank you very much. With us again, Lish Woodson of our Council Central staff. Lish, we've been talking about the UW Major Institution Master Plan for several months now, and um, during the budget process, um, the master plan resolution that we adopted was out for discussion and a back and forth. But before we get to that, the sort of resolution that might have come from the back and forth communication between the various parties, can you remind us a little bit about what the master plan is and how we've gotten to where we are today? Sure. Um, so you have two pieces of legislation in front of you, a council bill that would conditionally approve the University of Washington's 2018 Seattle Campus Master Plan and a clerk file granting approval as conditioned. And the clerk file um, is a document that sort of is a repository of all of the background information on the master plan. Um, adoption of this legislation would be the final step in the council's review of the master plan. Um, the master plan um, increases building heights and adopts development standards for development on the current University of Washington campus, including areas um, in the historic campus of the University of Washington uh, to the east, south, and west of that uh, historic central campus. Um, th the master plan would allow um, the university to accommodate an additional six million net new square feet on campus over uh, approximately 10 years. And that would allow growth of the campus population by 35,000 students over that time. Um, the council passed resolution 31859 in September. Uh, that uh, was the council's preliminary decision to approve the master plan with a number of conditions. Um, that resolution was circulated to the University of Washington Board of Regents, the City University Community Advisory Committee, and other parties of record um, who had an opportunity to respond to the council's preliminary decision. Uh, the council received 20 responses, um, and I'll go over those in just a minute. Um, then there was an opportunity to reply to the responses, and uh, the council received five letters in reply at that stage. Um, my memo for today's meeting has three attachments. Um, the first attachment shows changes between Resolution 31839 and Council Bill 119426. Um, these changes incorporate technical amendments um, and some specific changes recommended by the University of Washington that seem non-substantive or um, useful to incorporate and better clarify the uh, Council's intent. Um, for example, the council's findings now start with a short description of the University of Washington and its importance to the city and the region. Um, conclusions have been simplified to clarify that the council's authority to condition the plan rests on its general land use uh, police power authority, SEPA authority, and specific authority in the city university agreement. Um, attachment two summarizes the responses the council uh, received. Um, Issues raised by the Board of Regents and other petitioners include housing, affordable housing uh, requirements. The resolution would have required 150 units of housing be built affordable to um, university staff earning up to 60% of area median income and 300 units affordable to um, staff earning up to 80% um, of area median income. Uh, the University of Washington in their response has agreed to voluntarily provide um, that housing. Um, other responses that you receive, and um, so that's a firm commitment from the University of Washington. Um, other respondents have asked for more housing to be built, um, housing units of various sizes to be uh, included in those affordable housing projects. 
um, that the housing either be near the University of Washington or in other locations in the city of Seattle accessible by transit, um, and that the housing be not owned by or developed by a nonprofit or another or a public agency, including the University of Washington, but not limited to the university, um, in order to ensure long-term affordability of the units. Related to the single occupancy vehicle rate, which is sort of tied to the last discussion slightly, um, in the University of Washington's plan, they included a goal of 15% uh, of trips to the university by the end of the plan period um, to be taken by or made through sing by people using single occupancy vehicles. Uh, the council's resolution set a goal of 12% by the end of the uh, plan period um, by 2028. Um, in their responses, the University of Washington and the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections um, stated that they continue to believe that 15% is more appropriate and um, that they can achieve that goal. Um, other petitioners uh, recommended or supported the 12% goal and recommended that the university be required to achieve that goal even sooner by 2024. Um, related to parking, the plan included a cap of 12,300 spaces on campus, um, exempting student housing parking. Um, the council set a cap of, or proposed a cap of 9,000 spaces, including uh, how parking ex accessory to student housing. Um, the university's uh, response uh, recommended keeping the cap at 12,300, but including the student housing parking within that 12,300 space cap. Um, other petitioners supported the 9,000 space cap, um, including and recommended including the 750 spaces that are um, accessory to the former Safeco building, um, or I think it's the University of Washington Tower now. Um, those, those spaces are outside of the bounds of the major institution overlay and so aren't, aren't part of the um, University of Washington master plan. Uh, there was also discussion of uh, residential parking zone costs and uh, requests that the university be required to pay those. Um, let me go to page 177 to remind you about the um, building heights that were under discussion as part of the um, council's deliberation. So um, council, the legislation in front of you will make significant changes to heights um, across the, around the campus. Um, many areas, including the area um, southwest of the main campus, um, are proposed to go to heights up to 240 feet. Uh, the committee discussed two sites that, in particular that had been raised by the city university community advisory committee and the university district community council as locations where heights um, proposed by the university um, may not be appropriate. And that's site W22 um, here at the north end of the university bridge and site W37 on the west side of the university bridge. Uh, the committee voted to uh, consider reducing heights on site W22 uh, to maintain the current height limit of 105 feet. Um, the university in their response asked for an increase to 240 feet and uh, pointed to development standards included in the plan that will uh, reduce setbacks and um, help shape the building. Um, and in their response and reply, uh, KUKAC and the University of District Community Council asked for height limits um, to be uh, the current height limit, current lower height limits on sites W37 and, and W22. So they're supporting the council's uh, preliminary recommendation for W22 and continuing their call for lower heights on W37. 
Related to transit investments, the council, um, council's preliminary decision included a requirement that the University of Washington pay for capital expenses to improve rapid ride routes serving the campus. University of Washington and the Seattle Department of Construction Inspections have come to an agreement on a schedule of payments and a cap of $12.7 million um, that uh, would be used to um, implement those changes. And that's reflected in their letters. Uh, bicycle facilities, uh, the preliminary decision uh, called for separate pathways for bicyclists and pedestrians along the Burke Gilman Trail to be um, implemented implemented by 2024. The University of Washington asked that it be clear that they are being asked to separate users by 2024, um, but not necessarily create separate pathways beyond the current uh, Burke Gilman Trail, trail bed um, that's in existence today by that date. Um, petitioners asked uh, that the Burke Gilman Trail be widen widened and separated by 2021 or 2024, depending on who was writing the letter. Um, and the um, other petitioners asked that a bicycle parking plan be prepared um, as part of, or at, um, following on the approval of the campus master plan. Related to childcare, the council um, acknowledge the university's plans to increase childcare spaces on campus. Uh, petitioners asked that uh, the university be required to provide childcare um, alongside provision of affordable housing. Um, they also asked for a study and program for a joint employer employee voucher program, which is something that the council has previously asked um, the executive to work with the university and its unions to develop. Um, the city university agreement requires a um, re annual report on implementation of the master plan and um, a number of letters ask the council to report on issues uh, raised by community um, and endorsed by the council um, as part of that annual reporting process. And then uh, there were a few other issue ideas that were um, outside of the council's purview regarding the master plan, not related to those issues. So thus concludes the overview of the back and forth between the various appellants and proponents of the master plan process. Before we get to a discussion about amendments, Lish, which is I think where you're headed next, I wanna pause here and say it's my intent for us to, after we have some Q&A back and forth about what folks might wanna uh, talk about um, related to the, uh, the back and forth that happened between the appellants and the proponents, um, it's my intent that we will then consider a set of amendments and hope, I hope, um, pass the ordinance out today so that we can stay on schedule to allow for review of the full council by Monday the 10th and then allow for approval, um, the, the approval process that needs to go through the official Board of Regents process as well. But this ideally, um, you know, has been six or seven meetings so far on this topic and not a whole lot of significant changes in feedback that have come from the draft proposal that we adopted in September through resolution to today um, with the potential ordinance in front of us. But I wanna stop here and uh, allow for space for people to ask questions about the letter writing that has happened back and forth between the uh, appellants and, and the university. Any questions or thoughts? Please, Council Member Herbal. Um, I just uh, want to um, say I believe there is an exception um, to um, your statement that there haven't been that many changes um, in what we see in a council bill compared to the resolution that uh, the council moved out um, a few months ago. There is the change of, um, though um, the committee uh, voted to on site 22 to maintain the 105 um, uh, height, um, this resolution um, puts it to the um, height recommended by the University of Washington, uh, 240, is that right? 
No, uh, that's that's an amendment that I'm planning right. to bring. Oh, forward, it's an amendment. But, it's not contained no, in no. the in the in the bill itself. The bill itself has the hide at the proposal that came out of committee. I did not much, understand that. Much to my personal chagrin, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I'll be bringing that forward again for I'll discussion just, okay. as part of the amendment Perfect. process later. I was just using this as an opportunity to, to discuss it if it was already contained. Um, I hear that it's not, so yep. I'll talk about it later. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> I mean, I, I got that right, didn't I, Unleash? Right, okay. right. The uh, zoning changes incorporated in the ordinance uh, reflect the changes made by the committee um, in September. I didn't understand that. Okay, thanks. So any further questions about sort of the back and forth between the various parties um, between September and today? I'm not seeing any. So, Lish, um, as we contemplate amendments, talk to me first about the technical amendments that are included as part of attachment one. Do we need to make any motions to adopt those technical amendments, which you sort of no. gave a, a walkthrough of earlier? No, those are incorporated in the base bill. Um, they're provided there for transparency. So uh, I've had a chance to read through attachment one, and there are, there's nothing in here that I would consider to be anything other than just what Lish said, which is technical. So if folks wanted to pull any of those things out, happy to entertain that, but I don't think that there's anything in here in the technical attachments associated with attachment one that um, is anything other than um, small changes to elements of the findings of facts, for example, that um, uh, allow for a consistency between the various parties of record. So while folks review that, Lish, why don't we move on to the second part, which is the discussion about the individual amendments themselves. And we've got uh, almost 10 or so to review. Right. Do you want to start with, um, I think we're calling it a, um, Amendment A? Yeah. Uh, so this is a pretty simple amendment. Um, it adds a recital asking the University of Washington to include in its annual reports information about topics of interest to uh, the city and the community. And just as a note, other amendments uh, further on would amend this uh, recital to include additional items in the list. But um, it's uh, asking for uh, updates related to, um, me, sorry, um, Issues such as actions to increase access to preschool and childcare, implement a priority hire program, support local economic development, and integrate minority and woman-owned businesses into the campus and to update the city university agreement. So colleagues, a lot of the reason why we want to adopt the reporting requirement first here is because there are other things that we'll be asking for potentially as we get further along in the amendment discussion that also would require some sort of reporting. So we want to start with this reporting amendment and then other amendments may be reflected in an updated reporting uh, uh, section of right. the uh, bill when it's finally adopted. Any discussion or questions about that? Out. Okay, um, so I'd move to adopt uh, Amendment A as described in Attachment 3. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed. That amendment is adopted. Mr. Whitson, how about Amendment B1? So Amendment B1 um, is related to the commitment towards providing affordable housing. It incorporates the University of Washington's language uh, regarding their voluntary commitment to provide a, a, at least 450 units of affordable housing. Um, uh, that is affordable to various income levels. Um, and um, it would allow that housing to be built um, both within the campus, in the camp, broader campus neighborhood and then um, also in other locations accessible to tra by transit to the campus. Um, and it asks for reporting related to that housing. And this is sponsored by council members Johnson and Herbold. Thoughts or questions, colleagues? I would love to be a sponsor too, but I can <laughs> show my support by voting in favor of it. Um, just to, um, to make sure I remember the facts correctly here, Lish. Um, the ultimate number of 450 was derived from some evidence uh, in the record about 
the number of jobs that would be um, low enough wage to qualify for these levels of housing. And my recollection was there were about 900 jobs. And right. the assumption was that, that they would be two household jobs so that we, if we're you know, in a theory of creating the units for all these, that would be 450 units that would house two. Not that those people will necessarily be in these, but that was the concept. Um, it's great to see that there's a voluntary commitment, and I appreciate my colleagues' uh, amendment to um, kind of codify that commitment as a voluntary commitment, but we'll get the units of housing, which is what I care about. Okay. So, yep, please, Council Member. Um, I appreciate that there's reporting associated with this, but um, is there any, would there be a requirement to make a change given that it's a voluntary commitment if there, um, if the situation changed somewhere down the, down the road and um, the UW, uh, decided that they could not fulfill that voluntary commitment? Or that, would that just be something that would come up in the reporting? So that's a good question. Any change to the council's conditions mm -hmm. um, under the city university agreement is considered a major change to the plan, which uh, is generally considered a major change to the plan, which would need to come back to council. This will be recorded as a commitment on the University of Washington that they, that they need to fulfill. Thank you. Further discussion, folks? Okay, so I'd move adoption of amendment B1. Second. <laughs> Thank you. All, all, <laughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed, so amendment B1 is adopted. Amendment B2, Mr. Woodson. So um, this amendment is also related to those affordable housing units. It provides a little bit more um, flavor or guidance about um, the Council's request related to that housing, it asks for uh, University of Washington to work with its employees in designing uh, housing uh, using sort of best practices to uh, talk to the people who are the potential occupants of the housing before you start designing what that looks like. Um, consider a range of housing types and planning for the housing, not just uh, small studio units, um, and working with nonprofit developers or other public agencies to keep rents affordable in perpetuity. Councilmember Ryan, do you want to speak to this amendment? I'll just say that the, um, you know, the, the tools we have at our disposal are in some respects kind of suboptimal, um, but because it's a quasi-judicial process, we can't have the types of dialogue with various parties to kind of negotiate what this looks like and um, where our authority starts and ends is, is debatable too. And so certainly this is intent, um, uh, and as you mentioned, kind of best practices, and my hope is that University of Washington will follow that and do something kind of consistent with this. Thoughts or questions? Okay, so I'd move adoption of Amendment B2. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed. B2 is adopted. B3, Mr. Woodson. And this is from Council Member Herbold. It asks for the university to explore um, incorporating childcare in their affordable housing development, particularly related to um, family size units. Council Member Herbold. Nothing to add. Um, I think that this, you know, kind of continues with that um, transparency about um, asking folks to really take a real responsibility in making sure that we have uh, affordable child care throughout the city. So this is one that I'm happy to support as well. Um, so I'd ask for adoption of Amendment B3. Second. I have further discussion on that one. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed. Amendment B3 is adopted. Amendment C, Mr. Woodson. Uh, so Amendment C uh, would incorporate the uh, university and SDCI's proposed timeline and schedule for payments to um, implement rapid ride improvements. Um, and it also provides an opportunity for um, negotiation with the SDCI director if the university doesn't build um, the amount of square footage that's incorporated in uh, this condition. So that if they're moving more slowly um, they can negotiate with the SDCI director to sort of slow the payments. Seems like one of those things where we gave a little bit of extra time and the parties came together and came up with a good solution. So it's an amendment that I'm happy to support. It's exciting. Okay, so um, all those in favor, oh, I would say I'd move adoption of amendment C, please. Second. Any further discussion about that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed, amendment C is adopted. Amendment D, Mr. Woodson. All right, so Amendment D is related to Site W22. It would adopt a height limit of 240 feet 
um, for site W22, uh, which is again here at the north end of the University Bridge, um, generally bounded by East Lake Avenue Northeast, the one block of East Lake Avenue Northeast, 11th Avenue Northeast, and uh, Campus Parkway. Um, and uh, yeah, and enter uh, Rob Johnson <laughs> to make the pitch again to my colleagues about considering a different approach than the one that we considered the last time around. I won't reiterate all the um, talking points that I, um, I did when we discussed this in September, but generally uh, I, it's my belief that um, this amendment resulting in a 24-story uh, opportunity as opposed to the current proposal, which is only a 10-story building, is very consistent with the city's growth and equity goals, particularly around our light rail stations. We have, over the last couple of years, adopted uh, zoning heights in this neighborhood that are very compatible with 240 feet. This site would be about uh, two blocks from the future light rail station, um, which again is a neighborhood where we are trying to not only encourage more development, but also make sure that that development is consistent with the billions of dollars of taxpayer subsidy that is associated with the opening of those new light rail stations. And so I wanted to give this one another run and see if a couple of months of uh, time to think about this might change people's minds, but we'll stop there um, and ask for further discussions or thoughts or questions about this before we decide whether or not we want to move this one forward. Councilmember Bryan, please. Um, this, uh, remind me, you said this just a moment ago, but the, um, in the comment period between September and now, um, you said we received comments from KUKAC and um, someone else on this. Were there any other that, that was recommending that we um, maintain the lower height consistent with what we did in January? Were there other comments we received on this one? Or was that uh, a University District Community Council. Okay. And so were they, they provided similar comments. That was all we heard. Right, right. Okay. And do you have... Um, the University District Community Council's comments um, in the introduction to this amendment. Um, uh, would it also be fair to say we got a, um, comments from the University of Washington asking us to go back to the two, yes. to the 240 level? Okay. Yes. So um, uh, I'll speak to where I am on this, if that's okay. My um, uh, back in September. Some of the graphics and how this played out and what the design guidelines, what setbacks were required was something that I had an open question about. And so I went along with uh, the lower height because I had some concerns of kind of bulk and scale of it. Um, now that I have a better understanding of what's uh, allowed and required there, I'm actually inclined to support the higher heights. My understanding is that the, the zoning there now would require um, a maximum podium height of about 45 feet, and the podium um, could generally probably cover the entire lot, um, as shown there. And then uh, floor plate size on the tower above 45 feet at uh, around 12,000 square feet. Is that about right? 12,000 and change? Uh, yeah, I think it was 14,000 uh, potentially on this uh, site. It's about a 21,000 square foot lot. Okay. Um, and that's that's due to um, upper level setback requirements and tower setback requirements. Got it. So for me, that gives um, a sense, you know, it's still a large structure, no doubt, but it gives some flexibility that there's gonna be more um, air and light on that uh, as we go higher. And so I'm inclined to, to actually allow the height to go to 240 and support your amendment, Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Herbold, please. Um, just a clarifying question and then some comments. Um, so this has been a, a major point of contention um, around um, whether or not the comparison to residential towers that are sort of the slender towers is an appropriate comparison given um, that these aren't residential towers and aren't subject to that, that same bulk and scale um, requirements for that level of height. Um, is um, what Council Member O'Brien saying is 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 that mean that that's a appropriate comparison? Um, these uh, likely um, non-residential uh, uh, structures to the slender residential structures because of the the setback requirements. Right on a smaller site like this, um, 
it's more likely to look like the residential uh, towers that are um, permitted just north of the site than um, if there were a larger site, if comparing W21 and W22 up there, um, you can see the difference in massing and bulk um, between, um, that's primarily due to um, the site size mm -hmm. um, and if they choose to build a tower, um, there are upper level or tower setback requirements. So included. it's more about the size of the lot, not about, I mean, they're right. I, right. I mean, I do see there is, it's, it's more about the size of the lot, not that they're not allowed to develop on as much of the right. lot. Right. Okay. Um, so I just want to uh, go back to the importance of this particular location in a very, very long history of planning um, in collaboration with the University of Washington in the, in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, this long history of planning um, uh, and the focus on this particular site um, is important to the, to the community um, because the site is seen as um, a gateway to um, the university. Um, in uh, the urban center plan of 1998, this particular location was identified as a gateway. Um, and then subsequently in 2003, the campus master plan, um, you know, again, this is a, a document that is developed jointly, um, acknowledged this, um, where the site was then called 30W and promised that the University of Washington would develop the site as a gateway to the neighborhood and the university. Um, gateway locations shall include visual enhancements such as improved landscaping, signage, artwork, or other features that signify entries into communities. Um, and so I really see this, um, the height um, of this property and um, I, I think it's, I think it's visually um, demonstrated that it really um, has the, the potential to conflict with, with those long held goals for this site. And, you know, I just, I did a calculation on the number of um, square feet that this um, master plan um, is um, adding um, and it's six million total and the difference between um, the two uh, potential heights for this particular property, uh, the difference between uh, 175,000 square feet um, and about 87,000 square feet, um, it's a 1.5% um, share of that 6 million uh, total square footage. So it's a really small um, change and um, it's still, I think, you know, giving the vast majority of the square footage that the university has said that, that they need um, for, um, for their future. And I think, um, you know, taking back this very small number of square footage, um, again, 1.5% of the 6 million total is really in keeping with I, what I think the, the, um, the nature of this process um, is really about, and it's about um, collaboration and um, shared goals. So um, I hope I can um, get your support, but I think I know where, where the votes are fallen. I appreciate that, Councilmember Herbold, and I think, um, you know, just to, given the lateness of the hour, not to belabor this discussion too much longer, but um, as somebody who represents the area and as somebody who's seen a lot of development pressures happen in a lot of parts of the city where there's a lot of reluctance, to see new development, particularly new commercial development be located. Um, I wanna avoid the opportunity to have this fight continue to play out in a lot of other parts of the city where there is a lot of pressure for commercial development to be expanded, whether that's in our industrial lands areas or whether it's in other parts of the city that would be prefer to stay in a residential uh, look and feel. And so for me, I think that the concentration, rightly so, of commercial uh, development nearby a uh, major piece of infrastructure in a place where we already have a lot of tall buildings makes a lot of sense. And though, though you're right, it's a one and a half percentage um, change, 
um, fundamentally, I think it is the right thing for us as a city, given our climate goals, given our um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, given our affordability goals, given our um, objectives of making sure that people get other places without needing to have a car to maximize those investments. And um, that doesn't happen in a lot of uh, uh, places in the city. And I think this is one of those places where we should really uh, consider a change. So I'd like to suggest that we adopt uh, Amendment D, which would change the zoning on site W22 to 240 feet. I'll second. And can I ask one more question? Please. Um, Lish, I'm just looking at the text um, of, uh, well, the background section that's backgrounded in gray on page 73. And at the bottom, it talks about, it says, applying the development standards, the record indicates site WD22 would have a maximum theoretical tower floor plate size of approximately 12,100 feet. Sorry. But yeah. I, I just want to confirm that that's accurate. That's more accurate than that's my the memory. Great. Yes. Okay. And so that's a little less than 60% of the site, from my understanding. And so um, doesn't change necessarily any substance, but the, I just wanted to correct that for the public. And it also goes on to say that um, uh, adjacent to the U District, uh, sorry, which is comparable to the maximum floor plate for the residential towers in the adjacent U District, um, which are allowed between 10,700 and 11,500. So it's slightly bigger. Um, and we can debate whether it's comparable or not. <laughs> um, but I'll be supporting it. <laughs> yeah. Further discussion about this, folks? Try to get the facts straight. Yeah. So that's important. Thanks. Okay. All those in favor of Amendment D, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Uh, the amendment uh, is adopted. Um, we'll move on to Amendment E, Mr. Whitson. Amendment E is from Council Member O'Brien, and it asks the University of Washington to prepare a bicycle parking plan. I would move it. Okay. Um, any discussion on that, Councilmember Herbold? I'll second um, the motion to adopt Amendment E and ask all those in favor to please vote aye. 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 None opposed. Amendment E is adopted. Amendment F, Mr. Whitson. Amendment F um, is from Councilmember Herbold, and it asks uh, the university to work with its employees on a child care voucher plan. Anything to add, Councilmember Herbold? Um, I think <clears throat> for setting, stating for the record a little bit about the background on this and um, the uh, um, discussion that we've had about doing um, a study and sort of where that's at between um, the legislative department, the executive, and the University of Washington. Yeah. Um, when the council considered uh, reasons to the university district outside of the campus, um, it adopted a resolution asking for a number of follow-up items, um, one of which was working with the University of Washington, its employees, and other employers in the area on a child care voucher plan. Um, my understanding is that that has either failed to get off the ground or stalled. And there was um, a study component required, correct? Right, right. And um, this would sort of build on that request from the council to the executive. And okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think this is one of those examples uh, where things that we put in um, council resolutions because they're really important, um, uh, sometimes those things fall by the wayside um, when time passes. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the inclusion here um, gets us Back, back on track with doing the work that we committed to do, um, what, 2017? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, and I concur with this amendment, Council Member Herbold. I think it's also fair to say that the um, organizations that were advocating for this um, have also had some changes in their prioritization. And so I think that, that um, the, the work that we had intended to do was uh, asked for by um, particular members of the community who, um, when we went back out to them and asked for an extension or a delay or some collaboration, had said back to us, you know, we don't think that that is as necessary today as we thought it was in 2017 when it got started. Now, to me, I still think that this, as the person on this council who um, most regularly pays for child care, um, I still think that affordability and child care is critical. And the 
concept for us of a, a voucher program, I think is uh, one that's ripe for discussion, not just within the construct of this master plan process, but also around the city writ large. As um, my colleague council member, Ms. Gata, likes to remind us, we are one of, if not the most expensive places for childcare in the United States. So I think that the, the work needs to get done. The speed with which the work is, is not getting done is I think a frustration, but this is a good reminder for us to continue to redouble our efforts to ask for some kind of additional analysis and work to be done both within the, the city family and in collaboration with those outside the city family. So I'd move adoption of Amendment F. Second. Any further discussion about this one, folks? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed, and Amendment F is adopted. So we've got an amended bill in front of us. Um, any further discussions about that amended bill, colleagues? If uh, not, I'd move that we adopt uh, Council Bill 119426 as amended. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 None opposed. The amended bill is adopted, and that will be in front of full council on Monday. We have an associated clerk file um, with this bill that does all the things that clerk files do. Um, so any discussion about that that you'd like to offer, Mr. Whitson? It's basically all of the background material on the um, master plan. Any questions about that, colleagues? So I'm um, seeing none, I'd um, move to grant as conditioned clerk file 314346. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The clerk file is adopted and that will also be in front of full council on Monday, December 10th. Um, this has been a long process, Mr. Whitson, and um, we'd be remiss if we didn't spend a lot of time and energy today thanking you for the Herculean effort that you have undertaken a low these many months of public discussion, but certainly many months before the, the, the issue came to committee of uh, really, really great work to get us to this point. So I'm very grateful to you. These quasi-judicial processes are complex and um, necessitate a lot of weird um, non-dialogue between people, and you've done an excellent job of uh, helping to make sure that those firewalls existed um, and facilitating this process, and, and I just can't say thank you enough for your great work. Um, before we adjourn, other thoughts or questions, colleagues? Just to, uh, first of all, second, the thanks to you, Lish. Um, there's been a number of pro uh, steps along the process where we came up with collectively uh, what I would characterizes creative ideas and trying to stick to an aggressive timeline. Um, I'm really pleased that you and Law and other folks that you managed to corral were able to um, get responses back, specifically when we were on recess over the, the last couple weeks in August. Um, while I was enjoying the waters of the Gulf Islands, you were here toiling away with others so that we had some stuff done. So thank you for doing that. Um, I have a question about the quasi-judicial nature. So um, is this planning to go to full council on Monday? It is. Okay. And then when does the quasi-judicial, are, there, there are there appeals things or how long do we have to wait before we can actually have conversations with people about this or people in the audience who are looking at us right now can actually come and say thank you or you jerk or whatever <laughs> without violating anything? If you if you um, get thank yous, please let me know. I, I seem to be getting a lot of those you jerks nowadays. Um, it remains quasi-judicial until all judicial appeals have been resolved. Um, at a minimum, that wouldn't kick in until after the Board of Regents decides whether or not they're going to incorporate all of the changes that you have uh, adopted into their final master plan and adopt a final master plan. But I think there would be a period after that time wherein there would still be opportunity oh, for other parties to appeal. Okay. So um, we should all act, and folks in the audience, too, we ask you to act, and this will remain quasi-judicial. Folks are obviously welcome to celebrate or mourn um, however they want to, but we're going to have to not be part of that for uh, a little while longer. It sounds like weeks at least and maybe a few months. And I'll ask um, the law department to circle back around with um, central staff as well as our offices to give us a clear sense about what that timeline looks like. But I know at minimum we have the action on Monday.
Monday at full council and then some period of time before the Board of Regents takes action. So you can count on at the very least probably through the end of the year, this continuing to be a quasi judicial process. The question will be how much longer is that appeal window available to appellants? And we'll try to get an answer from the law department as soon as we can. Great, thank you. Okay, any further thoughts or questions? Mr. Whitson, you wanna take a victory lap here? <laughs> Okay. Please, Council Member Herbal. I just want to um, echo the thanks, but uh, a thanks not just for helping us maintain the firewalls, but um, really I think it's so important that you have gone uh, above and beyond to let us know what is in the record so that, um, I mean, there's just so much information um, and it's, I think, um, it would be really easy uh, for um, us to take, sort of take you know, a cursory view of what the options are, but I think you've done a really great job of helping us uh, dig in deep and um, know what we can know about um, of the things that are on the record, so thank you. Thanks. So um, we will have these two items, the council bill and the clerk file in front of full council on Monday the 10th. Um, we uh, may, may be back here on the uh, 19th of December to contemplate the um, conversation that we had on the transportation level of service standards. Um, it'll depend on vacation schedules and whether or not those staffers are, can be back at the table with us to answer additional technical questions that come up. Um, we'll keep members of the public in the loop about whether or not we need to uh, have that meeting as soon as we know the answers to those questions. But um, if there's nothing further for today, we will be adjourned and we'll see you again soon. Thanks all. all right.